It's just a scratch. Okay, maybe not here, but if it's happened to you, you know how painful the process can be. Ontario now reconsidering the criteria for collisions and reframing the reporting rules around fender benders. Good evening. We will bring you that story in moments. But first, in a country where your choices for air travel are slim to start with, this is tough to take in. Another low-cost carrier is out of business. Lynx launched with the promise of affordability, but less than two years after taking off, it's about to be grounded for good. CTV Scott Lightfoot is live at Pearson Airport with more. Scott. Nathan, this has really thrown a wrench into the travel plans of thousands of Canadians. You know, many of the people coming here to Pearson today were aware that Lynx was shutting down for good, but they were told that was going to be happening as of Monday. The problem is for some of the passengers here, they never got off the ground today. This pair from Ottawa arrived at Pearson Airport this morning knowing the airline they were about to depart on had already announced it would soon be shutting down. It was 8.30 and then it was like 9.15 and then we boarded the plane the pilot was getting clearance and then they said that it was cancelled. Their trip to Florida never even got off the ground, which was doubly inconvenient considering they had already made alternate arrangements to return from a place they were now no longer going to. Because we've already up front paid $600 to fly with American Air Airways back, back to Toronto in like five days and now like no way we have no way of getting there. It was a day of disappointment for Lynx Air passengers, first finding out the airline would no longer be in operation after Monday, but then finding out that in some cases it wasn't operating at all. This group had tickets to fly to L.A. this morning. That flight never even boarded. My plan was to come here, take the Lynx flight to LAX, and then come back Air Canada, right? Um, but then came here this morning, did all the check-in, all that, we're ready to board, and then they cancelled the flight on us. In a statement late yesterday announcing it was ceasing operations, the airline said over the past year, Lynx Air has faced a number of significant headwinds, including rising operating costs, high fuel prices, exchange rates, increasing airport charges, and a difficult economic and regulatory environment. The statement said Lynx would continue operations until Monday. However, throughout the day, several Lynx Air flights were cancelled without explanation. We're looking at JetBlue flying into Buffalo. Hopefully it sends a message to the Canadian airlines that be competitive, otherwise passengers move south. You take care of me, I take care of you. You don't take care of me, I don't take care of you. The airline instructing passengers to contact their credit card companies for refunds, announcing it had applied for and been granted creditor protection. If you've paid using credit card, then the credit card company has to actually refund you even if the airline doesn't reimburse the bank or the credit card. Early this afternoon, hundreds of Lynx passengers arrived headed for Halifax and Calgary, but unsure of whether or not their flight would be a go. I just want to go home. <laughs> just want to, I just got to get back to school. Yeah, I like to think I'm an optimist, so <laughs> I'm not really sure though. Staff from the GTAA provided water and snacks as passengers waited for word. In the end, they were processed and without a gate were bussed to board waiting planes outside, eventually taking off for their destinations, ending a stressful day for some, happy to be heading home or at least heading out. So that Calgary flight is just heading to the runway. Now it is delayed. There are three more flights that are supposed to depart from Pearson tonight. People have started showing up. They are checking in behind me. As of right now, those flights are still a go. Pointy live inside Terminal 1. I'm Scott Lightfoot. Michelle, back to you. Fingers crossed. Thank you, Scott. And straight ahead, an asylum seeker dies outside a shelter in Mississauga just days after arriving in Canada. And it's not the first time this has happened. What went so wrong and what advocates say needs to be done? But first, a live look outside on this Friday evening. A sudden drop in temperature is headed our way as the GTA prepares for some serious winter whiplash. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Jessica. A northwesterly flow to the wind has really picked up, Nathan, this afternoon, and it's going to continue to increase and help bring those temperatures down. The cold front has sunk in its way south, bringing some cold Arctic air as we kind of settle up. The good news is high pressure comes with this, so it clears things out tonight and into the day tomorrow. It's just not going to be warm. Temperature-wise right now, we're kind of sitting in the low single digits, a little cooler the further east you go. Ottawa sitting at minus 3 right now. As we head through the rest of our evening, winds are going to continue to pick up before they dissipate into the day tomorrow but right now that gust is just under 60 kilometers an hour through the island in Pearson hovering around the freezing mark tonight that wind chill wicked at minus 21 coming up a full look at your long-range forecast including how long the cold is sticking around but right now I'll send things back over to Nathan and Michelle all right thank you Jessica 
Turning next to a developing situation in Brampton, a man seriously hurt in a stabbing. The violence playing out as part of a robbery. CTV's Janice Golding is live near the scene with more. Janice. Hi, Michelle. As you can see, the road is blocked off behind us here. Uh, cars keep being turned around. We're just outside Ken Willens Drive Park in Brampton, and that is where the incident took place. Now, Peel Regional Police say they were called to the scene near Spruill and Ken Willens at around 2 p.m. Investigators say the victim, a man believed to be in his 50s, was stabbed twice in an apparent robbery. Now, paramedics say the victim was taken to a trauma center in Toronto with serious injuries. Police have been canvassing the area and collecting surveillance video, but at this time, no one has been arrested, nor is there a description of the suspect. Dog walkers in the area tell CTV News that while unfortunate, this incident does not come as a shock. We come here every day. As I said, this has never happened before. So, yeah, it obviously does make us feel less secure. I'm actually not surprised. There's, uh, there's a surprising amount of homelessness around here. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, you see a bit of, you know, stuff like that. You worry for your own security? Me personally, no. But uh, I could see people being... Now, Peel Regional Police say uh, they would like to hear from anyone who may have witnessed anything this afternoon around 2 o'clock or who may have collected surveillance video from their home surveillance se uh, systems. Uh, they would like them to contact them as soon as they possibly can or speak to Crime Stoppers if they want to remain anonymous. Reporting live, Janice Golding now back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Janice. Peel Police are also investigating a stabbing early this morning in Mississauga. At around 1 a.m., emergency crews responded to a home near Dundas and Winston Churchill Boulevard. Police say they were called regarding a man who'd been attacked several kilometers away near Dundas and Dixie. Investigators say the victim was approached by two men and a woman, and they allegedly demanded his belongings before stabbing him. His injuries are described as serious, but he will survive. There is anger and outcry tonight over the death of an asylum seeker, a mother of four dying after waiting outside a shelter in Mississauga. What can be done to prevent similar tragedies? This isn't the first time this has happened. CTV's Beth McDonnell is live with more. Beth. Nathan, there is outrage and upset after a second asylum claimant arriving at this shelter behind me died. Community members are calling on all levels of government to step up. With the hope of a better future, Delphina Gigi's new life in Canada ended just days after she arrived. The 46-year-old Kenyan widow and mother of four left her children back home and struggled finding a place to stay. It is very devastating to our community that we are going to be sending them her remains. Community members say Saturday Gigi was brought to this Mississauga shelter by a good Samaritan and in freezing temperatures waited between 1 and 8 p.m. before being let in the lobby. Police say paramedics were called Sunday. She then suffered a cardiac event and died in hospital. It's a terrible coincidence that she died under these circumstances. Peel Region, which runs the shelter, is offering condolences and says it doesn't feel the death is suspicious and there is no police involvement. Brampton's mayor, a member of Peel Region Council, says with no overflow beds available for Gigi, she stayed in the shelter lobby overnight. We got some federal funding, $10 million, towards this surge in our shelter capacity. Um, I found out yesterday we're now at 400% capacity. This is not a problem that is restricted to Toronto and Montreal. You know, this is the doorsteps at, at, at Pearson right now. The influx of asylum claimants has been putting extreme pressure on the GTA's shelter system for months. In November, a man from Nigeria camping outside the same shelter also died. This summer, religious groups picked up migrants sleeping outside a downtown Toronto intake centre because of a lack of beds. To our leaders of Canada, we've been shouting and we've been protesting, asking you to step up to the plate. Those working with claimants say Gigi and all those coming deserve better. Mayor Patrick Brown of Brampton says in a country as prosperous as Canada, asylum claimants shouldn't be falling through the cracks. And he's meeting with the federal immigration and refugee minister on Monday to find solutions. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Beth.
A branch of the Royal Canadian Legion in Woodbridge has had its charter revoked and will be sold. The move follows what the organization says was an overt association with outlaw motorcycle groups. The Legion's provincial president sent a letter to members that reads in part, we cannot permit the Legion's name or events to be associated with organized crime. Upholding these Legion bylaws and policies required decisive action by Ontario Command. We took that decisive action. We spent days weeks and months gathering information and discussing the final decision on the Mackenzie branch and concluded that revocation was the only choice. Officials say they learned of the gang activity from police and the charter was suspended in October. Branch 414's building and its contents will now be sold. After bills and debts are paid, the remaining money will go to support veterans and community programs. It's a move critics say will undermine faith in Ontario's court system. But Premier Doug Ford defended the appointment of two of his former staffers to a committee that helps select provincial judges. That's part of uh, democracy. You voted a party in, and I'd say that no matter what party's in. If the feds want to appoint liberals up in the federal government, that's up to them. I'm pointing like-minded people that believe in what we believe in. The Premier repeated his criticism of the justice system and bail practices. Ontario Liberal leader Bonnie Crombie accused Ford of promoting U.S.-style politicization on the province's judiciary. The NDP said the PCs were using their majority to make partisan patronage appointments instead of fixing an overburdened court system. Also today, the Ford government officially repealed its wage cap legislation for public sector workers, including nurses and teachers. Bill 124 got royal assent in 2019, with the province saying it was necessary to help tackle a budget deficit. But labor groups took the matter to court, saying the law infringed on collective bargaining rights. A judge sided with those workers in 2022, and the Court of Appeal upheld that decision this month. The province has already started paying back some of those lost wages. It is a cornerstone of the NDP's agreement to prop up the minority Liberals in the House of Commons. The New Democrats say a deal has been reached to table pharmacare framework legislation. Not only do we have legislation that specifically refers to single-payer, that refers to the Canada Health Act and the principles and values, we also have secured commitments to delivering diabetes medication and contraceptives using a single-payer public model. So we've gone beyond just the legislation and we're going to cover medication as well. The legislation is expected to be introduced next week. The NDP threatened to pull out of the deal if the Liberals didn't agree to certain terms by March 1st. With more here, CTV News Chief Political Correspondent Vashi Capellos. He does confirm what we had started to hear earlier today, which is that there is an agreement in principle between the Liberals and the NDP on the issue of pharmacare. You'll remember that the Liberals had until Friday, according to the NDP, to introduce legislation for universal single-payer pharmacare. There was some consternation about whether that would be the exact thing that was introduced through the legislation. According to Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP, that is what is in the legislation. It is explicitly for universal single-payer pharmacare. And there's more to it, he says. And he had signaled that this could be the case in the lead-up or through, rather, these negotiations. He says there's two additional items. There will be coverage for contraceptives, for uh, birth control for women, as well as coverage of diabetes medication. Just a few days ago, he insinuated that the Liberals were not on board with the latter, uh, with the diabetes and contraceptive coverage, but it appears, according to him, that they have uh, gotten on board and that that legislation will be tabled by the end of the week. Uh, a couple of quick things that I'd point out uh, that he said during our interview that I think will be fodder as we see the legislation and go through the process, I asked very specifically if there were any timelines attached to either of those things. So first, will we know that that coverage for diabetes and contraceptive, diabetes medication, pardon me, and contraceptive is coming sooner rather than later? He intimated that, yes, there would be some uh, something binding the government to do that sooner rather than later. But on the bigger question of implementation of a universal single-payer pharmacare system, which carries with it a price tag of about $10 billion a year. He did not indicate that there was any kind of timeline. An Ontario family is mourning the death of a 12-year-old boy killed in a house fire, along with four other relatives earlier this week in Saskatchewan. CTV's Rob Cooper is hearing from the boy's father as he prepares to travel west for the funeral. 
Hi, my name is Andrew Fustacci, and I am 12 years old. I live in a small, quiet town. Andrew Fustacci was a loving, smart, and caring 12-year-old boy who once lived in Barrie before moving to Davidson, Saskatchewan with his mother a few years ago. Sadly, Andrew was one of three children and two great-grandparents who died in a house fire on Sunday. Andrew was planning to move back to Barrie to be with his father. He was a very happy boy, very smart. He, there were so many things in life. He could have done anything. He was, he was the kid I was so proud of. The fire broke out in a home on Sunday around noon. Police say the fire is not considered suspicious. Andrew's dad says the family was celebrating a birthday when he got the horrible news. I just didn't know how to think because it's not a call that you ever expect, ever, especially at a time we were celebrating a birthday. It went from sweet and happy to just dark, really dark. As the investigation into what exactly happened continues, a GoFundMe account has been set up for the family to help with travel to Saskatchewan and funeral expenses. Yesterday evening, some, I don't know, angel on earth, we don't know who they are, they donated $1,000 to the GoFundMe. Um, so that just goes to show that there are good people in the world. Nikki Frustacci is Andrew's grandmother. It's hard because you, you're trying to get over so much things happening all at once and you go from happy, it's sad. One moment you're fine, just feel like you can't even enjoy the sunshine anymore. A life the family says was taken way too soon. I've wanted to become an actor for a few years now and I really hope that you guys can give me the chance to try out and, you know, maybe be on the big screen. Thank you so much for watching, and I really hope I get picked. Bye. Now, the family left Barry for Davidson, Saskatchewan this afternoon for Andrew's funeral. They are hoping to hold some sort of celebration of life for Andrew when they return. Rob Cooper, CTV News, Barry. Tomorrow marks two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. Ukrainian resistance has been strong, but the toll of the war has been extremely high. CTV's Heather Wright reports. They are a bitter testament to two years of war. Fresh burial plots in Kyiv's military cemetery. Some of the flowers only just beginning to wilt. Varvara's husband, Ruslan, was killed in December fighting in Bakhmut. She visits his grave often with friends and food one of the many made a widow by this grinding war. We are brave, we are courageous, she says. We are dying on our native lands, but we really need the help from the whole world. Among the flags flying here, a maple leaf honoring two Canadians, Cole Zelenko and Kyle Porter. They served together and died together when they were hit by Russian shelling last year. While Ukraine will mark the two-year anniversary of Russia's invasion tomorrow, for many, this war began long ago. So I live uh, inside of war, if I can say so, inside of war for 10 years already. When pro-Russian forces entered Ukraine and took control of the Donbass region in 2014, Sergei and his wife were forced to flee their home in Donetsk with only the bags they could carry. I can tell you exactly three. <laughs> so, uh, two uh, in my hands and one in uh, my wife. He doesn't think he will ever go back to his home. He doesn't even know if it's still standing. <laughs> Towns and villages throughout the east have been destroyed in a war that has killed tens of thousands of soldiers and civilians. Today, Ukraine announced it has launched investigations into more than 122,000 suspected cases of war crimes, something Russia has repeatedly denied its troops have committed. The atrocities are ongoing as we speak, and we understand that at some stage the, the figure will be 125 and, and, and will be more. Ukraine reported more casualties today. A Russian drone strike killed three in Odessa. Across the country in Lviv, the Danish Prime Minister joined Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to pay tribute to soldiers killed in action. More fresh flowers for those lost in a war, showing no signs of ending. Ahead of tomorrow's anniversary, President Zelensky continues his efforts to secure more aid. But the biggest package, $61 billion from the United States, remains stalled in Congress. Heather Wright, CTV News, Kyiv.
Meantime, Canada is imposing sanctions on 153 additional Russian entities. The measures target those backing the war through finance, logistics and sanctions evasion. They include senior officials of private and state-owned companies registered in Russia and Cyprus. The move is in coordination with the U.S. and the United Kingdom. Ceasefire talks were held in Paris in what appeared to be the most serious push in weeks to halt the fighting in the Gaza Strip. Health officials in the territory said that 104 people had been killed in Israeli strikes in the past 24 hours. 160 others were wounded. Israel's military said it had killed dozens of militants and seized weapons across Gaza since yesterday. Mediators have ramped up efforts to secure a truce in hopes of heading off an assault in the city of Rafah, where more than a million displaced people are sheltering. Israel's Prime Minister has presented his plan for the Gaza Strip following the war. Benjamin Netanyahu presented the document to the Security Cabinet yesterday. It proposes Israel maintains security control over all land west of the Jordan River, including the West Bank and Gaza. Israel would make reconstruction of Gaza dependent on its demilitarization. Palestinian officials have dismissed the plan as doomed to failure. Here in Canada, the RCMP is confirmed as dealing with a breach of its networks. The National Police Service has now launched a criminal investigation into the cyber attack. It says a breach of this magnitude is alarming, but insists there is no impact on RCMP operations right now and no known threat to Canadians or our allies. The moon's newest arrival is alive and well, but resting on its side a day after a white knuckle touchdown. The vehicle is uh, stable. Uh, near or at our intended landing site. Uh, we do have communications with the, uh, with the lander. How much? Officials also said today the lander is believed to have caught one of its six landing feet on the surface during final descent, and that's how it ended up propped sideways against a rock. Crews are now working to get what everyone is waiting for, the first images from the lunar surface. Thursday's touchdown was the first U.S. moon landing in more than 50 years since the Apollo era. And while we wait for the first pictures from the lander, take a look at this. NASA captured images of some solar flares. The sun emitted two strong ones this week. One of them peaked Wednesday night and the other reached maximum intensity shortly after midnight Thursday. The space agency used extreme ultraviolet light to make the flares visible. Coming up, the global surge in measles and the decline in vaccination among kids is a concerning combination. Canada's top doctor issuing a strong advisory ahead of the busy March break travel season. And I'm Pat Four, and coming up on Consumer Alert, when you buy a new vehicle, you can choose front wheel drive, four wheel drive, or all wheel drive. All wheel drive is now the most common, but even if your car has it, not all systems are the same. We check the differences. That story is just ahead. High pressure returns to our forecast just in time for the weekend, meaning lots of sunshine, but it is going to be cold. After a cold front made its way through, sinking down across southern Ontario, temperatures are frigid as we head through the overnight and into the start of the day tomorrow. That wind chill into the noon hour tomorrow, minus 14. Coming up, a full look at your long-range forecast. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Getting into an accident behind the wheel is the last thing any motorist wants to deal with. Not only the shock of the impact, but what comes after. Mm -hmm. The province now rethinking the threshold for how much damage needs to be done before you're required to inform police. And we have a crash course on what you need to know. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris joins us live with more. Siobhan. Well, it's important that people know that this would only apply to crashes in which nobody is hurt and there's no criminality involved. But the hope is that this will help streamline the process, shorten some lines at collision reporting centers. It won't be long until gleaming new cars like these will be driving down Ontario streets. Despite all the high-tech bells and whistles, some of them will inevitably wind up in crashes. Whether or not it means police have to be notified is all about how much damage is caused. This is a number that's uh, uh, been stagnant since 2015. So the government is considering moving the threshold to report a crash in which no one was hurt from $2,000 to $5,000. The government reasons that $2,000 threshold used to make sense, but as cars have gotten more sophisticated, added more technology and safety features, it doesn't take much to hit that $2,000 threshold. 
This is the place all the banged up cars come for a refresh, where the era of the cheap fix after a fender bender is a distant memory. From the front end, it may not look as bad, but in behind with modules, sensors, reinforcement bars, absorbers, prices have gone through the roof on parts. Take this Lexus. So this one was in a rear end collision on the left side. At first, it didn't look too severe. The initial damage estimate was $1,800. When the bumper came off, showing the dinged sensors and modules. It ex brought the estimate up to about $12,000. Including paint and labor. CAA doesn't anticipate any bad effects for drivers if the government moves the threshold. It helps provide some of that, that relief that if you are unfortunate in a situation, um, you know, you have a better understanding of where to go and that, you know, your lineups and wait times could hopefully be less. Leaving collision reporting centers to handle the more severe crashes. You know, if every single collision requires a report, that's a whole lot of people making a trip to one of our locations. And uh, it, again, if it's something that's so minor as a scratch, uh, it, it's a bit of a waste of resources. The transportation minister says he's looking at other jurisdictions to make a decision. Law enforcement officers or drivers uh, those on the insurance side as well to make sure that uh, we're taking a whole government approach um, and ensuring that uh, all, all sides are considered. The government is taking feedback until March 5th. Toronto police wanted to make sure that drivers understood no matter how severe the damage is that drivers should be exchanging contact and insurance information at the scene of a crash. Reporting live, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan and Michelle, back to you. All right, thank you, Siobhan. And you can find more information on the proposed changes on our digital platforms. Be sure to visit ctvnewstoronto.ca and download the CTV News app. Most vehicles sold before the 1990s were rear-wheel rear drive, but automakers later switched to front-wheel drive cars for better traction and better fuel economy. Now, more than half of all new vehicles on the road come with all-wheel drive, but not all systems operate the same way. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. Nathan and Michelle, all-wheel drive is different than four-wheel drive that you find on pickup trucks or large SUVs. AWD is a system that does all the work for you, giving you added traction. You might not need it, but it's a bonus if your car has it. Carly Stevenson recently bought this 2018 Mazda CX-5 for her growing family. I don't want quite as much room as an SUV, but I needed something bigger than a car. She says all-wheel drive, or AWD, was a must for an added sense of security. Safety and peace of mind. Consumer Reports says you should know not all vehicles with all-wheel drive are the same. For example, Subaru's AWD system always directs at least some of the engine's power to the rear, and it can direct a larger amount if needed. That's not the case for every AWD. There are other kind of more cost-effective ways or different ways of doing this where maybe the car is primarily driven as, you know, front-wheel drive. The front wheels are getting most of the power all the time, and then only in certain situations will it send power to the rear wheels. Nowadays, there are more AWD cars on the road. Thanks to technology, this transfer of power happens with a mechanical drive shaft running the length of the car. But electric vehicles and some hybrids utilize individual motors at each axle with no physical connection between them. These systems just allow all-wheel drive to almost be implemented easier in a vehicle. With a hybrid vehicle, like from Toyota, for example, they take an electric motor and they just put it at the rear and that's what's giving you all-wheel drive. So they really don't have to change much from the regular car to enable all-wheel drive. All passenger vehicles sold in Canada starting with the 2012 model year come equipped with electronic stability control, which along with traction control significantly improves road handling capabilities regardless of the drive wheels. So who really needs AWD? It's people who really live in snowy areas, who see a lot of slippery road conditions, or they live at the bottom of a steep driveway that is often wet or snowy or covered in ice. All-wheel drive will not only give you added traction, it will also hug the road going in and out of corners as well. And just because you have all-wheel drive doesn't mean you don't need good tires. Even the best systems will struggle to find grip on slippery roads if your tires are in poor condition. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Happy Friday to all. When we spoke during the noon newscast, it was mild, it was so comfortable, <laughs> we had the sun, and we have begun our descent mm -hmm. into the deep freeze. It's amazing how quickly things can change. 
And really, this is thanks to the winds picking up. They were northwesterly early on as well, but we've seen the gusts pick up. They kind of topped out around 60 kilometers an hour. They're dissipating a little bit. It's really added that bite to the air. So that cold front, we saw it on the map earlier today, has sunk in its way all the way down. And now that it's past us, we're sitting in that cold Arctic air. And it's not going anywhere as we kick off our weekend. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Now, it was a beautiful start to the day. Peaks of sunshine here and there, but that cloud cover kind of rolled in. And then it moved out as the high pressure settled in. So that's a good thing when it comes to a clear sky tonight and into the day tomorrow. But without the cloud cover, we lose any of that warmth that we built up. So it's that, that sealant, that, that blanket over you that keeps you warm, that, that lid on, on the leftovers. When you lift that up, all that heat escapes and it gets a little chilly. The food cools off and so do you. Uh, temperature wise right now, we're sitting at minus one. It feels like minus eight. Central Northern Ontario, they're already in that deep freeze with that cold Arctic air and it just continues as we head through the evening. A bit of a dip in the jet stream and those purples are beautiful color, those fuchsias, but when you see them on a map like this, it means it's really cold. It's gonna continue into the day tomorrow. So we're starting off our Saturday sunny, but absolutely freezing. Freezing in comparison to how warm it has been as of late. Tonight, the wind chill is so much the factor. It's gonna feel like minus 21 here in the city. It'll feel like minus 30 in Bancroft, the same through Perry Sound, down towards London, feeling like minus 18. Getting into the day tomorrow, we warm up slightly, but we're staying below seasonal throughout the day. We're looking at minus four for the high here in the city. It'll feel like minus 18, really the same right across the board. The further east you go, say Peterborough, Bancroft, Ottawa, their wind chill values are staying in the double digit range. Not a lot in the way of active weather. That high pressure holds firm, at least for our Saturday, but there is some active weather on the way as we head in towards our Sunday. As we kind of time everything out, it's not all that bad. Again, we get through the start of our weekend pretty comfortably. A lot of sunshine out there. It's really not until we get in towards Sunday where things start to change. Starts off as cloud cover. Then we're watching for the flurry activity, likely a wet snow for us here in the GTA to begin around 530 and it pushes out by about nine. And then by the time we get to Monday morning, lots of sunshine. Temperature wise throughout the weekend, we do kind of a flip the script. We start really cold on Saturday, nice and mild on Sunday. Monday back up to six degrees, getting in towards your Tuesday and Wednesday. Well above seasonal, but it comes with a chance of rain. But the good news is it's short lived. By the time we get through Thursday and Friday, the sunshine returns. And then by next Friday, we welcome in the spring season. Nathan. Michelle. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. If you're planning to take Go Transit this weekend, there's a major disruption to warn you about. All day tomorrow and Sunday, there will be no trains running on the Stouffville line to allow for critical track work. Metrolink says Go Bus Route 71 will replace train service between Old Elm and Union, but it will not stop at any of the stations in the city of Toronto, advising riders to take the TTC instead. Regular Go Train service resumes Monday morning. Also tonight, unexpectedly locked in predatory service contracts. W5 investigates the heating and cooling industry and the customers who say their homes are being held hostage. If you're planning to take your family away on March break, now is the time to make sure you've got your vaccinations up to date. And health experts across the country are urging parents to put measles at the top of their list. Here's CTV's Pauline Chan. We had a case of measles reported in Toronto last week. It was in an infant who traveled. Normally in Canada, we see about 12 cases of travel-related measles in a year. Already, from the beginning of January to um, the third week of February, we have had six cases. And Dr. Teresa Tam fears it is a trend that will continue. We know historically in Toronto, spring is when we see measles, actually, and that is related to travel. What's different about this year is that there's more measles in places where we don't usually expect to find measles, like in Europe, like in the U.S. In fact, in the U.S., over a six-week period from December to January, they had 23 cases reported. And because it takes about two weeks for the measles vaccine to take full effect, now is the time for your shots. A recent survey shows that almost 92% of two-year-olds got their first dose of the measles vaccine, but in seven-year-olds, less than 80% got the full two doses. The shots are usually given at 12 months and between four and six years, although previously second doses were given at 18 months. So one dose can give us 85% protection, but two doses gets us well past 90%, uh, 98% for example. Measles is one of the most contagious viruses around and it can linger in the air for two hours. Some children will go on to develop the pneumonia, the ear infection, 
some can get a severe brain infection. Um, and that's why it can be serious and can, can lead to death, unfortunately. Since January, Toronto Public Health has offered catch-up clinics for a range of vaccinations, including measles. Community clinics that are set up across the city uh, at three sites, at Scarborough Civic Centre, North York Civic Centre, and Etobicoke Civic Centre. And we have clinics at uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, some Saturdays. If your child is younger than a year but over six months, you can arrange to get your vaccination early if you're traveling. And if you're not sure... If you can't remember whether you got measles before, you have no vaccination records, an extra dose is, not, is, is, is okay to have. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Filmmaker Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry says he's putting a major studio expansion project on hold, citing concerns about artificial intelligence. Perry committed hundreds of millions of dollars to build 12 new sound stages at his Atlanta studio facility. But he told The Hollywood Reporter those plans are now on ice, as video AI tools show rapid advancements. Perry cited the release of OpenAI Sora as potentially reducing the need to pay for travel or sets. But he warned AI poses a severe risk to jobs in the entertainment industry. HBO has set the release window for another Game of Thrones spin-off series. We're approaching five years since the original series wrapped up. While prequel show House of the Dragon will drop its second season this summer, execs at Warner Brothers Discovery say a separate prequel series is now in pre-production. The show is based on George R. R. Martin's book, A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, and will debut late next year. After the break, Toronto got one yesterday. Today, it was Brampton's turn. Premier Doug Ford handing out another big check for meeting housing targets. We'll explain. This is a number that's uh, uh, been stagnant since 2015. Updating our top stories, a major change could be coming down the road for vehicle collision reporting in Ontario. In crashes where nobody is hurt, the province is considering increasing the threshold that would make reporting mandatory. That figure could jump from $2,000 up to $5,000. We boarded the plane, the pilot was getting clearance, and then they said that it was cancelled. While Lynx Air isn't set to halt operations until Monday, the carrier cancelled a number of its remaining flights today. The airline said it was shutting down, citing financial pressures and other challenges. Lynx Air advised anyone with an existing booking to contact their credit card company for refunds. This is a big step forward for universal single-payer pharmacare. And federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh says his party has reached a deal with the Liberals on pharmacare legislation. He indicates diabetes medication and contraceptives will get covered first, but did share a timeline for other drugs. The NDP had demanded movement on pharmacare in exchange for propping up the minority Liberals in Parliament. On the markets, the Canadian dollar is down a fraction to 74.06 U.S. Oil losing more than two bucks a barrel to close at 76.49 U.S. And the TSX Composite Index adding 95 points to 21,413. There's another major cash infusion from the province today, part of a push to encourage municipalities to build more housing. Brampton's progress in building homes is just absolutely incredible. Premier Doug Ford gave Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown a check for more than $25 million, saying the city met 85% of its housing target in 2023. That followed a similar check presentation here in Toronto yesterday. $114 million for smashing the local building target by over 50%. Hundreds of employees are receiving layoff notices from Vice Media. A memo sent to staff by the CEO says the job losses are part of a restructuring at the company and it'll no longer publish material on its Vice.com website. Vice filed for bankruptcy last year before being sold for $350 million to a consortium led by the Fortress Investment Group. The company is also looking to sell its Refinery29 publishing business. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. This weekend, CTV's W5 takes a look at the heating and cooling industry and the unexpected hidden costs customers are often faced with. They put a lot of fear into my father, and he was worried. Like, he, he wanted to 
make sure that his house was in good working order. So they sold him on this air conditioning unit, which from what I've researched and what I've looked at, it was like, like two, three thousand dollar value. But in reality, it was going to cost Peter's dad more than $18,000 in rental fees over a 15 year contract. It wasn't worth the money. <laughs> it, it, they, they sold him on like just lies, basically. Tens of thousands of customers across Canada say they're being put in an impossible position, alleging they're locked into predatory service contracts they say are holding their home hostage. The report is called Who's at Your Door? And our John Woodward joins us in collaboration with W5 with the details. John, the sales pitches, what do the customers think they're getting? Yeah, Nathan, so the, the person comes to the door, says, would you like to enter into a long-term contract to rent some kind of equipment, like water softeners, water heaters, that kind of thing? And that's perfectly legal. Uh, the issue that you saw in the clip just there was that these contracts can be very large, a lot of fees. And then it gets really strange, where part of this contract allows the company to put a hold on your property. It's like a lien. It's called a notice of security interest or a NOCI. And it could be a lot of money. And these things come into play years after the contract signed. So when you try and dispose of the house, maybe you're moving an elderly parent to, to a downsized home, that's when they say, excuse me, no, we need to get paid. And the amounts are staggering, tens of thousands of dollars sometimes. And these people, when they're in, they're in these high pressure situations, they often pay. And that's why this can be astoundingly lucrative. Well, on the surface, it just seems like it's downright wrong and so stressful. How, did this, how does this affect the customers, the folks you talk to? Yeah, some of them are financially devastated. There, there was one woman we talked to, Deanna, Diana Ricketts, whose dad was a working guy, worked at the YMCA for most of his life here in Toronto. And he gets one of these visits, buys one of these products, and he dies. But this contract lives on. And so she, when she's trying to figure out how to, how to handle her dad's assets, is stuck negotiating with this company in his name. And uh, it's tens of thousands of dollars, as I remember it. And one of the issues that came up when we looked at it is it, there's more to it. There's, there's records and documents and recordings of how the salesperson interacted. And there's a lot of questions about who that person even was. And why is it so easy to put holds on customers' properties? Yeah, it's way, way easy. And the reason we know that is because we did it. So Joseph Loro, the, the producer, uh, went out and got an, a, a thermostat, put it on my house, <laughs> and then we went to the lawyer and, and went through and did all the motions to set up an OC, uh, paid the, or, or looked at the uh, nominal fee. And the answer is you can put essentially as much money as you want. I just said 10, 10 times the price, and there was no limit that we were presented with in that, in that scenario. And so the lawyer who's uh, fronting this class action lawsuit says that's the kind of thing that's happened many, many, many times over all of these customers. And when you add it all up, he says we're looking at tens of millions of dollars across all of these consumers. Well, I know with your reporting, you don't just talk to one side. I'm dying to know what the companies are saying here. Yeah, so the company says, look, we, you know, we have a lot of salespeople. There's an arm's length relationship between some of those salespeople. And they might not be responsible for what is said in the moment. And as for the CEO of that company, he also reached out and said, look, we, have, we were acting ethically. And so I think what I want people to do when they watch this is, is judge for yourself, right? We're going to do as best we can to present this fairly, but you want to see... Uh, who you think is, uh, is in the right here. And also, there's, there's some of these tactics you're going to see in your own life. You might have seen them in, in, you know, in, your, in your past. As we want people to be forewarned, forearmed. And so if you see something like this in your own life, here's what it could be at stake. Mm -hmm. An opportunity to remind loved ones as well to keep an eye out for this sort of thing. John, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Love to have you in the studio with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. And we will tell you that you can tune in to his full report. It's called Who's at Your Door? It airs tomorrow evening at 7, W5, right here on CTV. Tonight, breaking down the deal for National Pharmacare. This is a big step forward for universal single-payer pharmacare. What coverage Canadians can expect in the next agreement between the NDP and the Liberals, later on CTV National News. Hi Toronto, I'm Teddy Wilson. And I'm Nicole Servinas. So welcome to Things to Know TO. Each week, this show shines a spotlight on a wide variety of local businesses, services, events, and initiatives from across the greater Toronto area. These companies are part of what makes Toronto one of the world's most vibrant cities and a great place to live, work, and play. Join us every week on Saturday mornings for Things to Know TO. And don't forget to visit our website, thingstoknowto.ca, to check out all of our great content. The Toronto Raptors are back at it tonight after ending a three-game losing streak. 
choice words, but hey, it doesn't make me a bad guy. Here's DJ Carton with the left. Toronto beat Brooklyn 121-93 last night at Scotiabank Arena. The Raptors will look to make it two wins in a row when they visit Atlanta tonight. Toronto is four and a half games back of the Hawks for the final play-in spot in the Eastern Conference. The Blue Jays' top pitching prospect will not start Saturday's preseason opener after all. Ricky Tiedemann has been scratched due to left hamstring discomfort. The team says it is a precautionary move. The left-hander will likely begin the season in the minors, but could potentially challenge for the fifth spot in the Jays' rotation. Chad Dallas will take his place tomorrow against the Phillies. All right, one last look at the forecast, and things really getting chilly. It's the wind. It just bites through you. We had such a mild kind of end to the week, so I think a lot of folks are maybe caught by a surprise, even though we've been talking about it all day, that you'll need the layers as you head out tonight and into at least the day tomorrow. The good news is it's short-lived, and by Sunday, back above season, by Monday, up to 6, and a lot of sunshine. So we will wrap up the winter season and step into the meteorological start of spring on Friday next week in a really mild way. Jessica, thank you so much. That's it for us, but be sure to join Heather Butts tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.